Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, unschooling mom and author, bringing you interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free Exploring Unschooling ebook, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 31 of the podcast. It's the 3rd of August, 2016, as I record this intro. In this episode, I ask Emma Marie Ford 10 questions about unschooling. Emma is an unschooling mom to two girls, Lily, who's nine, and Rosa, who's five. She's also a clinical psychologist, and she writes online at rethinkingparenting.co.uk and radicalunschoolers.uk. She enjoys thinking critically about life, and her interests include radical unschooling, attentive and attachment-based parenting, and critical approaches to psychotherapy. She has a wonderful perspective to share with us, and bonus, she gives us a glimpse at unschooling in England. I kind of feel like the podcast has just leveled up. Yay! (laughs) I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Now, as a quick update, I just wanted to let you know that Anne Oman and I just opened registration for the next Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit. It's being held in Bethany Beach, Delaware, October 19th to the 21st. We've been fine-tuning the program and are really looking forward to immersing ourselves in unschooling with all of the attendees. You can find lots of information, including the schedule, feedback from previous attendees, and how to register at childhoodredefined.com. And if you still have questions, feel free to email me at pam at livingjoyfully.ca. This week, I wanted to share a quote from the episode. Emma and I were talking about how many conventional assumptions are steeped in the idea that if we don't direct our children to do or not to do things, they never will. Emma explained it this way. It was amazing how many of the assumptions that were challenged for me by having my first daughter. The fact that we did breastfeed for longer. The fact that she was with me most of the time. I hadn't even anticipated how intense it was going to be, even though I kind of had some idea. It's been being guided by them, but also working in partnership with them. It really comes down to trusting our children. Trusting and eventually knowing in our hearts that they are not trying to manipulate us, but are trying to get their needs met. And her point about working in partnership with them is key. She shares some great examples in the interview, and it's in this partnership that trust grows so beautifully. So let's get on to the interview. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Emma Ford. Hi Emma. Hi Pam. (laughs) It is so wonderful to have you on the show. Emma is an unschooling mom to two girls, Lily who's nine and Rosa is five. Before becoming a parent, she received her doctorate in clinical psychology. She enjoys thinking critically about life, Her interests focus on radical unschooling, attentive and attachment-based parenting, children's rights and rethinking mental health issues, and critical approaches to psychotherapy. She writes online at rethinkingparenting.co.uk and radicalunschoolers.uk. I have 10 questions for you, Emma, so let's dive in. Okay, great. Question, (laughs) Question one, can you share with us a bit about you and your family and how you came to unschooling? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me um, on your program because I've, re- I've like really been um, enjoying listening to the podcast. So I just wanted to say that at the beginning, and I've oh, just been you. learning so much from it. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, I, I um, live with my husband John, um, who I met about at university about twenty years ago, and we were both uh, studying psychology at the time. And John now works as a, a lecturer um, at Plymouth University um, in psychology and computing. And I've, as you've mentioned, we've got two daughters. It's Lily that's nine and Rosa that's five. And um, before having children, I trained and worked as a clinical psychologist with children and families. Uh, but I stopped working when I was pregnant with Lily as I wanted to be able to clear some space because um, I knew I wanted to be able to sort of stay at home and look after them. 
and I felt it was sort of like really important to be emotionally available for them and not stressed or preoccupied with work or sort of worrying about having to go back to work, you know, while they were really young and I wanted to be there to sort of like look after them. Um, we live in a in an old bed and breakfast um, in Cornwall. It's not a bed and breakfast anymore, um, mm. but uh, we're in, we live in a seaside town and uh, we sort of like enjoy living near the countryside and the beach. Um, yeah, so I was... We were practicing sort of like attachment based and re responsive parenting. And I was reading a book, I think it was by Jan Hunt called The Natural Child. And it talked about ideas about um, schooling and um, John Holt. And I really liked the emphasis that Jan placed on the importance of relationships and how she really sort of like nurtured a close connection with her son. And unschooling and attachment parenting seemed to fit really nicely together for me. And it did seem to lead on like as a natural progression, um, you know, with valuing, placing the relationship first, following the child's sort of like natural curiosity about the world and also learning through play. And I was really excited and I went on to read John Holt's um, observations of, of children learning to read um, in their own time without needing to be taught. And it just made so much sense to me. And um, I was going to say before um, having Lily, um, I was actually, after I'd qualified, I was work, uh, I was doing a training course in, in infant observation, which was it lasted for three years while I was working, and that involved um, observing babies and children at home in the nurseries and preschool settings, and so I was sort of I had been thinking a lot about children and, and babies and reflecting on their behaviour and their emotional development, and. I was aware of how important the context was. Um, so when I was observing in preschools, I, I, I was sort of like observing that children were maybe getting upset when they were being dropped off by their parents. And when they were, you know, there was lots of children and maybe only one or two teachers. And so they, a lot of them were like wandering around and sometimes they might be upset or um, they, they were sometimes playing together, but sometimes not. And there'd be difficulties. And there wasn't always an adult there to, to respond to them and to sort of like to, to, take, to take care of them, really, and to nurture them. So when I was sort of reading about, you know, John Holt's ideas, it was all coming together in my mind. And I was thinking, oh, this sounds really, you know, really good. Um, you know, I could, she, we can be at home together and we can learn together. And, um, you know, I can continue to sort of like breastfeed Lily um, which was something that, you know, that was another important aspect of the relationship. And so a lot of the issues that I might have been worried about, you know, like having to sort of wean before she went to school or nursery or um, having to separate before she was ready. Like unschooling seemed to provide a lot of the answers and, and you know, like a really exciting alternative. So it was actually like a really positive thing because when I read John's, um, John Holt's you know observations it, it was like that it wasn't just a sort of it was just the children could learn at their own pace in their own time and without much in, without sort of like interference from an adult really so that kind of made me feel more relieved because it wasn't like I had to teach it meant that I could sort of sit you know not not sit back completely but to be there but sort of facilitate and nurture the skills and the sort of like the interest and the curiosity that you already had um so that's really sort of how I came into sort of unschooling um, was from, you know, from that basis. That's really interesting. I like the that point you just made uh, of not the, you know, the not sit back piece. It's uh, not directing them, but being available and there to help them. And it, that's, that's a really big piece of it. But it was interesting that, because um, <clears throat> Jan Hunt's site was one of the first ones I came across right. as well when I first was looking at unschooling. So that's really cool. And back at the beginning, I think one of the big points I wanted to bring out was uh, that you were looking to be emotionally available for your mm -hmm. kids. That's, that's a really big piece of it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, because even if we're, making the time it's it's actually being there and available with them even you know even if you're physically spending time with them mm -hmm. um that doesn't particularly help unless you're actually um open to them and available to meet them where they are right yeah 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 and i i i, I mean from doing the child observations 
I observed a mum and baby at home for three years and it was a really sort of special experience because I, I got to see, um, you know, sort of their, the dynamics of their relationship and then we were able to sort of like talk about that and discuss that in a group context and so I was, we were sort of able to look at things from the mum's perspective and from the baby's perspective and, and I kind of, I suppose I de developed a sense of how important it was for a parent to be responsive and to you know, I guess to be flexible um, and to be there, to be engaged. Um, so, yeah, I had all those kind of things in my mind. And then um, I suppose when Lily was born, um, I was sort of quite uh, amazed at how um, quickly she did attach to me and how she did want to be with me and how, you know, that she would let me know um, if, if um, you know, like she wanted to be fed or she, she wanted to sort of be close to me. She, she was quite sort of clear about that um so I was suppose I was guided by her as well so I, I couldn't have I didn't feel that it would have been right for example to separate to go to nursery because she had such close attachment to me um and the same with the breastfeeding um that was something that I didn't know how that would pan out but we ended up breastfeeding sort of for, for a longer term you know for quite a few years and the same with Rosa and um, that's been something that's been really important because they've wanted to you know like this they've wanted to breastfeed and I've luckily you know fortunately I've been here to be able to sort of to do that as well and to sort of be um engaged and haven't had to go back to work um and we haven't had to go to the children haven't had to go to school so that's been able to continue um which is something that I remember I remember um Paula Rothenmull she's sort of like a psychologist in the UK and um she did some research into home educating families um, with a PhD and she, I remember she mentioned, she sort of mentioned that actually one of the important things for home educating families that came up was that they could continue to breastfeed. Um, so they, so I think the nurturance is a really important part, you know, like of the relationship, which, mm. you know, which kind of underpins the basis of unschooling. That's how I feel, you know, like that you go on that kind of the, the trust that you have with your children um, emerges from all these early interactions. Um, so it, that's, you know, I suppose that's, the, that's been the basis um, for, for me of unschooling. Yeah, it all it all kind of comes together when you look at it. I think we get so caught up um, in general on, you know, as parents on on our schedule. Right. And we worry, you know, it, it's it boils down to the trust in the child, doesn't it? Because we worry that, you know, they'll breastfeed forever unless mm -hmm. we direct it, that they'll never learn to read unless we direct it. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the child's timetable may be longer than we're conventionally led to believe. Mm -hmm. But when you trust them, they do get to all these things, don't they? <laughs> yeah. And, and it was, it, when you say that, it was amazing um, how many of the assumptions that I, were challenged for me by having my first, you know, my first daughter and the fact that we were we did breastfeed for longer, um, you know, the fact that she was with me most of the time, you know, I hadn't even anticipated how intense really it was going to be, even though I kind of had some idea. Um, and just how, yeah, how I've been, I suppose it's being guided by them, but also working in like partnership with them mm -hmm. um, just from the very beginning, you know, that it wasn't just that they were they were giving something, they were bringing things to the relationship um, you know, just even like in learning to breastfeed, it was a joint thing between us. We had to learn together. And um, mm. it, that's something that and we've learned to play together, I guess. And we've learned, you know, like we explore the world together. Um, so the whole idea of the, you know, and schooling philosophy just fits really well, um, you know, with that kind of, you know, like approach, I guess. Um, mm hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Let's jump ahead a bit because I'd love to hear more about your children now. So how do they like to spend their days and what are they interested in? Yeah, um, Lily and um, Rosa, they're both really passionate about Minecraft. And um, Lily, like she's, she's nine now, but she's really passionate about gaming and she identifies herself as a gamer. And she's loved Minecraft so since she was about four. And um, it's been really amazing to watch how that interest has developed, like over time. And um, she started off sort of playing with her dad, just uh, and and really mostly observing um, let's play videos on YouTube. So it was actually sort of like quite a long time before she even sort of started to play it. So she so it's really interesting watching that, you know, like that she 
her way was to observe and then to sort of like engage with it. Um, and from the outside, you wouldn't necessarily know that all that was happening. But when she started to play, she already had so much information and knowledge um, that, that, you know, that was just like quite kind of quite fascinating to, to see. Yeah. Um, and she sort of like just gradually progressed. So at first she'd only play on creative where, you know, that she couldn't lose her objects or there weren't any monsters. And then she became more and more confident over the years. So she, and then she started to play on servers and on survival. Um, and then sort of playing with other children online. So really kind of, um, enjoying interacting and, she learned to read through sort of her interest in Minecraft as well because she wanted to be able to sort of chat to her friends um, on Minecraft chats. And um, I mean, me and her dad have kind of always been alongside her, sort of like helping her to type and helping, um, you know, if she had any questions. And as she's got older, you know, like we don't have to be quite as involved anymore because some of those things now she's sort of doing for herself. Um, but we've kind of facilitated... I suppose that that process, and um, so that's been interesting to watch that. And Rosa is the set like she's five, but she's starting to play Minecraft since she was about four, and um, they often enjoy sort of playing things together. And um, I was going to say as well because Lily, I was talking to Lily before the interview um, just about some of the questions and we were sort of chatting about it, and she was um, we were talking about how she's developing a server. And like she's actually got a, a role play server and she's called it Lilacville, um, just specifically for sort of like imaginative play with her friends. And um, I just think it's really nice, the potential of sort of digital media and computing and games to sort of enable children to express lots of different aspects of themselves, um, you know, which comes into what we talk you know, like about play. And um, but that's been nice. So that's one of their main their, their main interests. Um, that's really interesting. I love how you um, talked about her whole journey from the observation right through to now developing your own role play service. That's so cool. And I think, you know, I, I saw that with my my children, too. Like my eldest um, was gaming was his was um, a very big part or, and continues to be. Um, way to dive into his interests and stuff and stories and RPGs and everything. But it's true when we first um, picked up a game system way back at Nintendo 64, actually, I think it was a PS one that we got first. It was, and yeah, he would watch his dad play, you know, mm. for, for a few months, he mostly mm. like sat and watched him play. And then, and then when dad was at work, he would play a little bit, but if he would get to a hard spot, he'd just, you know, pause it and wait till dad got home to work through the stressful spot and he'd play the easier spots and just bit by bit by bit. And that's something they don't um, get a lot of time for, you know, when, when school and mostly when conventional expectations are in the way, right? Because parents often feel that they, well, you need to get through that. You need to try that. That's that's how you learn. That's how you, you know, step up. But when you sit back and watch how they progress through it, it's fascinating. And that's how that's how they're learning, how they learn things, right? So that whole process, you know, Lily now knows and she'll she can apply it and be comfortable applying it to all sorts of different interests along the way. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's fascinating to see the sort of the progression I suppose, and, and the, the ongoing interest and how it yeah. develops over time and um, how they're le like Lily's not I, I like your quote because I've got your quote here which um, it's, it says video games and YouTube aren't interested in themselves they are the tools your child is using to pursue their interests dig deeper and I, I mean, me and John, and as a family, we're really um, into digital media because John sort of teaches it as well and oh. at university. And, um, but it's something that we've really fully embraced because it's enriched all our lives. And when you made that quote, I was sort of thinking about, you know, like it isn't, you, you could miss so much if you weren't really engaged with your children and sort of participating with them and really enjoying it because it's so rich and they're, le they're learning so much, not just 
you know, like in terms of the content, but also the process. So they're learning about sort of like their, their relationship, like how they like to research things, um, how they like to maybe like to observe it first, like you mentioned with your son, you know, like and how mm-hmm. um, they can have control of that process as well. Um, I think that's really important, you know, that we're around like to support them, but ultimately, you know, that they're, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's kind of their choice of how, you know, like um, deep they go and how far, how far they take it. Um, yeah, that's how they're picking up the whole process for themselves, right? Their their learning process, their how, I mean, not even lear- learning. I mean, that's kind of how we frame it, but how they pursue an interest. Yeah. And that that's cool that you shared that quote, because even as I was, you know, a couple minutes ago, replying and saying gaming was Joseph's interest, like that, I could barely get that out because I'm like, yeah, that's not really... <laughs> the gaming was the tool that he was using to pursue. But then I'm like, oh, do I really want to get that deep? But yeah, that's exactly (laughs) the point. (laughs) Well, I mean, Lily identifies herself as a gamer. Um, She sort of, Mm -hmm. she fully embraces that. She, she likes what that identity, you know, like that means to her. Um, She finds it empowering. And um, I think it's sort of given her um, the ability to sort of communicate with other people as well in a way that's meaningful. You know, she's found friends online who share the same interests. And I think sometimes, I mean, obviously they don't go to school, but, you know, the experience of going to school can in some ways um, be dis- you know, disempowering. And I think for us, um, unschooling, it's been, you know, naturally just finding ways that, that enables Lily to have a voice and to feel sort of like empowered and, I think that gaming has provided her, you know, with some of that, um, which mm-hmm. is um, which is nice, and it's, it's developed over time. Um, and we're get, we're actually going to go and meet um, with one of the a couple of actually the families that she's played with online, which um, Lily's sort of really and we all are really excited about. So um, it's uh, yeah, interesting how it kind of develops. I know, I know, it's really really fun, and yeah, we went have gone through that too you know connecting with people you know um through through these interests um and and then eventually starting to meet up with them face to face that's really fun Mm -hmm. (laughs) um next question Uh, is it okay just to say a little bit more about um because i know absolutely because they they both i was just gonna say because that's just one piece of their sort of like interests but they oh sure go ahead (laughs) <laughs> so they also love <clears throat> they've all, like Lily and Rosa like they're really passionate about dinosaurs and paleontology and so we visited you know like loads of museums and fossil festivals and um we they love dinosaur play um and they collect like lots of dinosaur related toys and obviously the games and the apps as well and um <clears throat> that's that's been a big part of the last sort of nine years or when she was from when she was about three maybe so in the last sort of five years or so and Rosa is really sort of like into it as well so that's something we all enjoy and they love creatures um and animals and we visit sort of like different places aquariums and um animal sanctuaries and they love together they wanted me to say that they love puffer fish that's their <laughs> one of their things that they like and we just I suppose we just have quite an, a rich and sort of active life we we go on many little mini holidays quite a bit throughout the year <clears throat> I get kind of cheap cheap deals and we go away um and stay sort of like in a caravan somewhere we might not have been before we might go and stay near friends and um we just enjoy going out exploring the local area and the part of the reason we can get cheap deals is because we're not at school you know so we can go in the times when it's quiet and so we get you know like a, a, a cheaper deal which is useful and um, and I was just going to say, and, and Rosa also, they both have some separate interests. And Rosa sort of like loves horse riding. And we've been visiting like a, a little riding stable since she was two. And there's a horse called Misty that she's sort of quite attached to. And um, Rosa is also passionate about collecting flowers. And she likes princess play and um, dressing up and imaginative things like that. And, and also um, Lily has just really got into Harry Potter and I know that you've spoken about that before. I think it's your daughter that was really interested in reading those books and that you sort of like read them together. And it, it's been really sort of interesting that we had the books for quite a few years, actually. We sort of found them in charity shops, but it's only been in the last sort of 
several months that um, Lily's sort of really, we've both got into it and she's bringing the books to me all the time every time we've got a spare moment to ask me to read more, you know, like so we can find out what's happening. So that's quite, um, and that's coincided with her being able to read um, or, you know, like her beginning to like read more fluently. And, um, and Rosa is into sort of, in terms of reading, she, she likes Mr. Men and Ella Bella Ballerina and Katie Morag and Madeline. She wanted me to sort of let you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> There's so many connections in there. You tell them that I love pufferfish. Okay. No. It was like okay, my crazy. thing when, um. <laughs> <laughs> when I was when I was a child. Oh, I don't know. Um, must have been down the Caribbean somewhere because my dad used to work for a travel company. So every once in a while, if there were extra flights, like extra seats on the flights, we'd be able to scoot down there. And I had. Um, like a found in one of the shops or something a puffer fish that was like blown up and uh I, I don't know how they preserved it or whatever but I had that on my shelf at home for years <laughs> we've got we've got one of those as well Pam oh there <laughs> like, you go <laughs> yeah no my mum my mum gave it to us and I think she I think she found it in a charity shop and it's yeah they, they kind of really like that so they've got that yeah that's cool. And then the horses, you know, Michael's, uh, when we first uh, moved out here rurally, both Lissy and Mike um, did some horseback riding for a while. And now he's working with horses uh, again with his uh, new job at uh, Medieval Times and Harry Potter. Yes, that was a, a key piece of Lissy's kind of um, road to reading. And but as we've talked about, you know, when you dive, it's it's. Hard to imagine, but when you die, really get deep into an interest, like as I'm sure you're seeing even with the Minecraft, that there's so many different places that it reaches yeah. out to, right? It's not, um, it doesn't put blinders on. It's like, I love this so much, I want to pursue it this way and this way and this way, yeah. you know, it kind of opens up so many things. So that's very cool. Thank them very much for sharing all their uh, <laughs> their fun interests oh yeah one other piece was the um going away on short little vacations we did that a lot when the kids were young you know even if we were living outside toronto but we might go into toronto for a weekend mm -hmm. or we might go to niagara falls for a weekend we might you know just any any little place because yeah there's just different things to see and it just kind of um uh you know whip things up for lack of a better phrase, you know, because you're in a different spot and, um, you know, just really conversations change up a little bit. And yes, when we're not going to school, we can get all the, you know, the deals of low travel time, right? Yeah, no, definitely. And it, uh, yeah, it's, it's been really good to, um, to do that. And I think having to, I mean, Lily's nine now, but, when, you know, as they've been growing up, it is quite intense. And I, I find that it did help me as well, like to, to get out and about and they enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. So we were sort of doing things that we enjoyed together and, um, you know, learning new things together. So, um, and, and also being able to visit, we live in Cornwall and we, there are families, unschooling families near us, but, you know, it, it's nice to sort of go and spend more time with particular families that we knew or to visit my mum and, and we used to do it like that. So keeping those sort of mm -hmm. connections with people. Yeah, yeah, that really helps. That's cool. Um, here's a question that I, uh, come across pretty regularly and can't answer it myself because my kids did go to school for a while. But, um, when Lily approached school age, um, was she curious about school? Did she have friends that, uh, went off to school? And I guess Rosa is probably approaching that age right now. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what the compulsory school age is in the UK. So just curious how you've talked to them about that. Mm. Yeah, um, well, Lily's never really been interested about school or going to school, um, but we have had conversations about it, and um, we've always said that if they wanted to go to school, then they could. That you know that we would support them in doing that, and um, we've we've never really we we're, we're sort of like not necessarily against we weren't against school, you know, but we thought that what we were doing was was right for them at the time. And so if they change them, I mean, we obviously see the benefits of home, you know, of unschooling and home educating, but mm -hmm. we realize that it's, 
you know, there might be reasons that they might choose to go in the future. But, you know, Lily's quite, so we do have conversations on and off, but Lily's quite adamant that she sort of wants to carry on as life as she, as we are, and that she really enjoys it. She doesn't want anything to change. Um, we've, I was going to say Rosa, maybe when she, last year, when she was four, she'd been watching sort of things like Sid the Science Kid um, on video. And she was kind of curious about what it might be to be like to go to play school. But she didn't really want to go to school. Um, and so we went to some home ed, home ed groups that, you know, where, where we could play with other children. And that seemed to be what she was looking for. Um, we haven't tended to go to a lot of groups. I mean, we've tried them, but Lily, my older daughter, she wasn't as keen. She preferred to meet up on a sort of like a one-to-one -one basis with families rather than being in the group situation. Um, and we've had quite a few in the past, um, over the years, we've had friends that are in school and we, they've spent a lot of time with us. We've sort of get, we've, we take them out on the weekends, visit places, um, you know, farms, Eden project that's near us. And we've, meet them after school to go swimming, things like that. And they have said to Lily on occasions, oh, would you like to go to school? But she's always just said no. And they also share sometimes things that they, you know, don't, aren't, don't particularly, you know, like about school. So, it, yeah, that's, it's been a bit, a, a bit of a, you know, we've met people from school, but we are happy and the children are happy at the moment with the lifestyle. So that we need. Yeah, that's awesome. I, uh, your point about um, Rosa's curiosity and, you know, going to check out some home ed groups, I think that's a big one because it's not like the question really isn't just school, yes or no, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, what if a child is expressing an interest, you know, actually finding out where it's coming from because uh, maybe there's all sorts of other ways that you can help them get and, and even um, better get what it is that they're actually looking for. Right? Yeah. yeah, I think that was when I I read um, Sue Wolf Patterson's book about homeschooled teens, and I think what came over in that to me was, you know, like really that if any sort of issue or thing, there's a there's a solution to it in, in the sense of, you know, if they want to have more engagement with their with friends or if they want to play with other children or you know, if, if they wanted to learn a particular thing, there's probably ways of meeting the need um, in creative ways. But at the same time, you know, if, if ultimately they did want to go to school, then that, you know, that, that would be an, an option. Um, yeah, because there's creative ways to go to school too, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think that the issue about, you know, being able to go to school and being able to have a choice about that does make a big difference. Um, exactly. It changes the power dynamic completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely do school, uh, go to school, like on your own terms. I think there's a, a bit a piece on Sandra Dodd's website about that. But yeah, once you've got a choice to go there and you know you have a choice to leave if it doesn't fit well and, you know, you don't have to buy into the whole um, grade structure and having to do, you know, feeling bad about yourself if you mm. don't do well on tests and stuff, you know, that doesn't have to come with school. No. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, um, so. Go ahead. I, all I, was, I was just going to say, I think a big part of it has been like our relationships. So they don't necessarily want to go to school because they don't want to leave me and John. And I don't, you mm -hmm. know, just in the sense that we and they enjoy spending our time together and we do we do do lots of interesting things together. So I think I, I am mindful of that, you know, that I know that if they are going to be at home, I always remember there was a quote, I think it maybe by Sandra Dodd about, you know, if you're going to you know gonna unschool then it needs to be better than school um or more interesting or something like this or sparkly and I, I do mm -hmm. keep that in my mind that I I do try and create um and, and John you know that we do try and create their lives so that it, they're interesting and enjoyable and that we're with them and spending time with them because I think if we weren't then school may you know may be more attractive option and you know children do want to have you know they need to have their needs met so you know if they're not being met um at home then you know maybe school is a, an option um for some children you know or, or so that's why I, I keep that in mind you know that you know I need to be um thinking about what kind of you know like environment and what kind of relationships were you've got 
Yeah, that's a great point. I remember, yeah, I would use that too. You know, it was just a good check for myself because yeah, if, if their life isn't as interesting for them as going to school would be, then, you know, I would want to support that for them to go because yeah. <laughs> an engaged and interesting life, that's, you know, kind of the, the point. So yeah, I would always, I would use that. It's like, Oh, you know, as a self check, um, is there more that I can be doing? Or, you know, sometimes, um, they would go through quieter periods. So if I was wondering if, you know, we were doing enough, uh-huh. um, I would, bring suggestions to them. You know, that's kind of my sparkly nature. If they're like, you know, no, thanks, no, thanks. And it's like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So you are, you are comfortable and happy with maybe more of the internal work, internal engagement that you're doing right now. But yeah, that check to, you know, make sure we're not just kind of stagnating because I'm feeling lazy for a while or whatever. That's always a, mm-hmm. a great check to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of school, I was wondering if you could just give us a quick overview of what it's like to unschool in the UK, the legalities, and you've mentioned some local uh, home ed groups and stuff. So uh, I guess uh, they exist. How easy are they to access that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's legal to home educate and to unschool um, in the UK. And it might vary, you know, like that, you know, in, in Scotland or Ireland or Wales. So it, it would be if people are sort of interested, it'd be worth them sort of checking out um, for, for more information. But, it, uh, you know, like in England it, and it's, it's legal and you don't have to follow any curriculum and you don't, there's no need for children to be um, assessed and parents are, are free to educate in ways that they choose as, as long as that they're providing the child with a, it's, it's like they say it's a full a full-time um, and efficient and suitable education for the child's age ability and aptitude and you also have to make sure that you meet any sort of special educational needs but otherwise you've got you know freedom to sort of educate your children in the way that you feel fits them and um you know like is meaningful you meaningful to them and to you um, so it's, it's a really good place um, for home education at the moment um, because we have got that freedom um, to do that and locally um, there's you know like we have groups um, they're not specifically necessarily unschooling groups but they're sort of that you can arrange sort of meetups and you will find unschooling families there and some groups are more um, unschooly you know than others and so you know, we can seek those out and they do, you know, we do things like there's rock pulling and horse riding and um, climbing, lots of different activities and that we can take part in. And we do dip, we dip in and out of them. And so we, we have a choice, you know, it's nice to know that they're there. We don't necessarily go every week. Um, and so I, I um, run a local home ed group to arrange meetups so that you know families can get together and and do that and and, that, and nationally um, there's an organisation called Education Otherwise and they have details of lots of local groups uh, home educating groups all across the country and they've got a website and Facebook page so it's quite easy for people to access um, you know like a list of their local groups and what's going on um, from them. Oh, that's awesome. And that's great that you're hosting a group. (laughs) We found, I found that too. Um, Here in Ontario, yes, there wasn't that many unschoolers. So we would uh, check out some more general homeschooling groups. And then, yes, you would typically find some unschoolers in there. Mm -hmm. And we also kind of dipped in and out of a few things because, yeah, my kids weren't so much into the big group things. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we soon, we soon ended up doing more one-on-one stuff and connecting through interests themselves, you know, girl guides, my daughters, you know, Mm -hmm. just interest in, um, crafts and activities, more formalish activities that way. And my son's interest in karate and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So that's great to hear. It sound, that sounds pretty similar to um, what the regula- homeschooling regulations are here in Ontario as well. You just say, yes, I'm taking responsibility for this. 
Yeah, I, don't, I mean, in England, we don't even have to do that. You don't even have to um, sort of enrol anywhere or you, you've just got the, you have, you know, the, you can home educate. You don't need to let anyone know about that. Um, and uh, no, so if, no. if a child's been in school, um, the school can notify the local authority and then they might request, um, to, you know, like to, to know whether, you know, what your what kind of education you're providing. And then you can provide an educational philosophy if you choose, you know, so you don't even have to, you don't have to meet. You can explain, you know, what you're doing and what your intentions are. And then maybe they might sort of, you know, like said, ask you to do that maybe once a year or something. But because mm-hmm. um, Lily and Rosa have never been to school and we haven't needed to to do that. Yeah, our letter's optional too. I mean, we, we did it for the first while because I did take the kids out of school. But then once we moved, it was too much work to find out where to send the new letter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, question five. Mm -hmm. I love the article that you posted on your website that describes unschooling. It's called What is Unschooling? And I'll definitely link to it in the show notes for people to read in full and maybe share with uh, extended family and stuff because you dive into so many different aspects and you include a detailed reference list. So I love that. But I'd like to dive into a couple of points from it with you today. So the first is that unschooling isn't child-led learning, but rather a partnership. So I was hoping you could explain the difference for us. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think that unschooling, so to me, is, is I call it all about the relationship and all about partnering our children. And I think there's maybe sometimes there can be an idea um, that partly arises out of Sort of the idea of self child self directed learning that the adult sort of stands back and, and kind of observes and takes a back seat and doesn't really involve themselves very much. It, I think in maybe in the UK there's a kind of a branch of autonomous learning that might be along those lines, although I'm sure people have their own ways of sort of thinking about it and sort of defining it. But so yeah, it, it, it's sort of thinking that we take an active role um, in our children's lives, really, and that we kind of shape the environment for you know that, that they're in. Um, when you, I think, when you get to know your child, you know, really well, you kind of have a sense of the different types of places that they thrive in, and the places where you know may, maybe it's that they don't get on so well that they might struggle. Um, and I suppose it's very uh, an interactive sort of partnership where you're working together um supporting you know like supporting their interests or being present with them engaging with them um and i i really like the idea of um sandra dodd's unschooling nest um because i remember when she has there's a video on youtube and she talks about you know how the emotional atmosphere and climate of the home is as important as the you know like the, the physical environment and the other opportunities that you provide um, so I, I like, you know, the idea that the parent is engaged, present, interactive, and which is maybe, I mean, it could be that people, I think people have different sort of ideas about what child led learning means. And I suppose in a way, unschooling does mean different things to different people. And, and this is kind of my take on it, you know, that is very much about the, you know, the relationship and working together and, so I, I liked um, Pam Sarusian's article on schooling, which which I did talk about in my in my article in my post, um, where she mentions about um, and schooling being like a dance, like a partnership. In, and is it okay to do the quote for, from her? Yeah, sure. Her article. She just says, and, "And schooling is more like a dance between partners who are so perfectly in sync with each other that it is hard to tell who is leading." The partners are sensitive to each other's little indications, little movements, slight shifts, and they respond. Sometimes one leads the other, um, sometimes one leads and sometimes the other. And I think that sort of really captures the nature of the, the relationship um, and sort of being alongside your children, working with them. So I think that's where that, com- you know, that's where that comes from. Um, mm-hmm. That's the view of unschooling that I really fully embrace because I think in my experience I have seen children whose parents aren't partnering them and I feel that there are consequences to that I think that children do 
sort of suffer emotionally. Um, and I think by being present and engaged, you're sort of like really nurturing the relationship. And so self, I mean, self-directed learning, you know, a child can be self-directed, but with the support and sort of, of, the, of the parents helping to facilitate and, you know, checking things out and making suggestions. It's really a dynamic sort of two-way process which I don't think yeah, is necessarily captured with the sort of child-led learning. Yeah, that's uh, your point about it is what how we think of them because you know, I think when when you when first comes to unschooling it's like it's still all about who's directing, you know, so okay, I'm unschooling now, so I'm not going to tell my children what to learn. So if I'm not directing things then they must be directing things. So I think that's kind of where the idea of child-led comes in. Mm -hmm. Now, it, that's not the point at all, right? So that's why, you know, that's why I like that. I love that point that you made um, because it's part of the de-schooling process, I think, to get to the point where you find what Pam Sarushin beautifully described as that dance, that partnership, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's so much harder to put into words, like child led as in, yes, they follow their interests, but not as in they're directing things. It's that partnership um, becomes so important, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I think. And, and that is once you can get to that place um, where because if you're giving up directing, then, yeah, that. Um, that can feel like, well, if I'm supposed to do that, I'm supposed to sit back, right? So I think part of the of the learning about unschooling process is where you get to discover that beautiful dance that you can do together and how that's actually even more supportive and, and helps your children more because, yeah, they've got that emotional support. They know that you're there. They can they are comfortable asking for help. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that whole dancing is such a more effective metaphor i think yeah 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 that's beautiful and i guess it um, changes as they grow the, mm -hmm. the type of relationship you have so and over yeah time. and that that's the great thing though because because through the partnership you get to um, know each other very well and that trust develops that um you can you naturally see each other they see you grow mm -hmm. um and you see them grow and and I think that that's another thing that comes up pretty often um, is parents sometimes being scared or nervous about, um, you know, stepping up for fear that they're going to hurt the relationship a little bit. They're going to overstep their bounds. But when you've got that trust, your kid um, is comfortable pointing that out to you, yeah. right? And yeah. Even if it takes a little bit of recovery work, oh, gee, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean it that way, or I can see how you took it that way. You know, that's, that's all part of learning about each other and learning how to dance together, right? Sometimes you step on a toe. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, just very, very open. And yeah, we make mistakes. And um, part, I mean, part of developing a healthy attachment, I think, is is the they call it rupture and repair so they accept that sometimes you are going to get it wrong you're not you're not all, always going to be attuned and, and part of, of building the trust is being able to go back and say yeah sorry I, I got this wrong and working it together working it out you know like how, how do we go forward and um that is part of building the trusting relationship um like you might you know mention you know sometimes that you you're gonna get yeah you're gonna get it wrong um but i find that lily and rosa do tell me quite clearly yeah. um, <laughs> that i've got it wrong <laughs> so uh and then i can do something about it um mm. yeah i kind of i kind of love those times i mean maybe looking back but <laughs> but it's like yeah that that's when i know okay you know they're comfortable coming to me they're comfortable speaking up and you know that's important so i i know that I'm not like uh, overbearing <laughs> yeah and I, I'm ho I hope it doesn't change as they get older because one of the big things for me like I had quite tumultuous teenage years and I wasn't I didn't sort of feel particularly connected to my parents and so and schooling is another you know because we're focusing on the relationships and 
there are really good examples like you yourself and your children and um sue and you know lots of other people that have got some um, teenage children older children who have still got good close connected relationships with their parents and i suppose that's i'm hoping that they can still come to me and tell me you know like if i have them something that they don't agree with or you know or, you know so i want them to sort of feel that they can that we've got that two-way relationship mm -hmm. as they get older so they don't cut off and end up sort of you know not including you know us because they feel that they they can't um yeah so i think that's another yeah. benefit School. Yeah, and and I th I think yeah you are building you're building that foundation those relationships now, um, I I think you know that that that's going to be kind of your best th those open and trusting relationships and continuing to focus on helping them reach their goals. Mm -hmm. I think when when you hit the teen years, that's another spot of deschooling for parents really mm -hmm. because then you haven't really you know, theoretically, you've thought about, you know, the conventional messages and stuff. But yeah, when your kids start to become teens, and then people start asking, well, are they going to go to high school? You know, mm -hmm. that, that's another time um, mm -hmm. when conventional expectations start coming up. But if we do the work to process through those and not put them on our children, and to continue to help our children meet their goals, I think that goes a long way to helping keep that relationship and that trust going. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's fun. Uh, the second piece from the article I wanted to dive into was trusting our children's intrinsic motivation to learn, because that is so counter to the conventional belief with school that children don't like to learn and they need to be motivated to do it through grades and rewards. So I was wondering how that trust developed for you. Um, I, I credit John Holt with a lot of, <laughs> with, with a lot yeah. of, it was re reading, I mean, I think there's, a, I've had lots of different influences. And I, I was also, from the early days, I did, um, I was involved, not involved, reading really, on always, um, unschooled it was at the time. And you interviewed Meredith Novak a few people, uh, you know, like not too long ago. And um, yeah. I listened to that. And Meredith is one of the people that I just remember her writing and her voice from when Lily was two or three. And those voices, and the other, there was other mums on there as well who sort of were talking about their experiences. And that really help me I, I suppose what I'm getting to about building trust with children and trusting children um, all, all of that really you know, like helped to inform um, how, how I you know, develop the relationships and how I saw my children um, and, and John Holt really though you know just when I just remember quite clearly him talking about how children learning to read how they like to snuggle up next to their parents um, how the physical contact was important and like the emotional contact and just and he said that you know like you couldn't really a child wouldn't really feel safe to do that they had to trust you first before anything you know, before they could learn um and before they would even want to read with you that they needed to trust you and that really it fits well with kind of i suppose my philosophy about you know like valuing sort of like the child's emotional well-being and um so and, and just I suppose I see trust um, emerging from the really early relationships. Like I know we've talked a bit about it already, um, but you know between mother and baby and, and parent, you know, and dad. But in in the early days, it was really I could really um, sense, you know, that if I was you know, meeting Lily's needs, that that was building a sense of trust in her, you know, and in me, you know, that she sort of felt that if I meet her, you know, that she must be worthwhile, that I'm meeting her needs. Um, and that that I think that gives children a sense of confidence in the environment and that it's OK, you know, that they can let their curiosity um, develop and flourish, really, because they know that they're safe to do that. I think that you do need to have that kind of that, that I suppose that the trust emerges from within those early relationships. And um, yeah, and that, that it's just like a natural progression, really. And just I could, could see that. I mean, I remember John Holt, you know, saying that don't you don't need to correct a child when they're learning that they'll do that naturally. And I just had all these, I did have these things in the back of my mind, and I just observed that that was the case. And sometimes, if I did make a, you know, like a small comment just to see how Lily might respond, she she would either ignore it. She sometimes 
often ignore it or carry on doing it just like John described you know like it was just that she would carry on doing it in her own way and over time she would correct her own mistakes and so I I could see that it was you know that I, I could trust that they would learn and that took a lot of anxiety away from me as well because it meant that I didn't have to be responsible for them you know learning everything or learning to read that they were doing that themselves with my you know with my support um, that's yeah I think um, that's that confidence in the environment and feeling safe I think that's such a great point that that um really is kind of at the foundation of the difference between the learning environment at home and at school. And, and you can see how that plays out in so many ways. That, that story um, from John Holt, I'm going to try and because uh, we, we had a question in the Q&A episode uh, last week that that ties perfectly to. So I'm going to make sure she gets that <laughs> because, yeah, it is OK, you know, for them to um, – hold on to something and, you know, uh, 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 something that's, that doesn't work, but they think is right or they think is true because they're going to, you know, use that in the next situation, the next situation, and they're going to figure it out, right? You don't have to fix things I immediately. No. In, you know, and go ahead. No, I've, I've just seen that time and time again. It's, and it's just in, I mean, it's just interesting to, you know, when you read, re John Holt, and you see his observations. They, you know, obviously they were made quite a few years ago, but I've, I've I've just witnessed that so many times that they will sort of correct themselves, and so I do tend to stand. But I mean, obviously now Lily's getting older. Sometimes she'll say to me, "Oh, is that how you spell this?" And obviously I I just tell her, you know, like I don't make an issue. I'll just you know answer her questions directly. And if she is wanting to know whether she's typing something correctly, I'll tell her. But if you know, I think it's changing as, as she's getting older because she's more asking me. But when she was younger, I think it was better to stand back. But even then, I guess it's up to the individual. It'll be to the individual child, um, you know, what they're wanting. Some children might like it if the parent, you know, corrects something. They might prefer it. But with mine, I just, they haven't. Um, yeah, that, that, that's the whole point, right? That's the dance. That's the partnership. Yeah. That's knowing each other and what um, each other would like versus, you know, the parent wanting to make sure the child gets this information, even though the child's not interested in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I well, think, that's um, great. I was I think in, when I was observing in sort of preschool, I, I, and I obviously from my own experience going to school, it, it was like learning took place out of the context of relationships and you were sort of almost separated and taken away from your parent, you know, like to go to school to learn. And John Holt and other, you know, and, and schooling parents who write about it, it's just it's all about learning within the context of relationships and really sort of seeing how valuable that is and how it just, you know, makes learning more fruitful and more possible. A lot, I think a lot of the issues that arise children having difficulties is because, you know, it's been all their learning and they've been taken away from their parent, their, um, you know, like in, a, in a, an environment that isn't sort of like facilitative of their emotional needs and well-being. And I think that is such an important piece um, for children, you know, generally learning. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because, well, a, a classroom environment is more around more around judgment, right? Rather than around trust. You know, they, they have to worry, you know, if they attempt an answer, you know, number one, if it's on a test, it's, you know, going to be wrong. And then that's embarrassing. Or if they're answering a question in class, are they going to be wrong and people are going to laugh or whatever. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's so much more um, stress wrapped up in that learning rather than the safe and, um, trusting environment that you have at home and it's amazing like you can't even imagine I know before I found unschooling I couldn't imagine that learning could be that you know fun and relaxing <laughs> that's yeah just so part of every part of everyday life yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. that's it you know when you talk to unschooling kids I sometimes certainly when my kids were younger you know we never like called it learning because they're just living and doing and that's when you see that Learning is literally a whole, a, just just a part of living. Mm. Yeah. Um, question seven. Another article that you wrote that I love is about the benefits of play. 
I know we had uh, a chat with um, Jody Lilly on the podcast right, a while yeah. ago. Yeah, and I will link to that in the show notes. Unschooling parents are pretty savvy about children learning through play, but I was hoping you could talk a bit about some of the benefits of parent and child playing together. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think, yeah, like you, I think unschooling parents are, gen- you know, generally embrace it, but there is also, I think, there's an element where um, there's a, a movement, or you know, that parents, that children should play away with, play away from their parents, um, that it's not you know, that they need to be completely self-directed and a parent, you know, they should play with other children or on their own. And that's kind of seen as a, a, a good thing developmentally. And I don't really a- agree with that kind of approach. I mean, I think if a child wants to play alone, that's fine. But I think, and sometimes Lily and Rosa do, but they also, I think, benefit so much from playing together with a parent. Um, I think it deepens the, de- well, first of all, it's like really fun. And so they enjoy it. And they like we laugh and you know do rough and tumble and stuff like that and so it helps to deepen our relationship together and um i was i was going to mention briefly that alan there's alan shaw he's a neuropsychologist and um he talks about uh, modern sort of like attachment theory and the benefits of play in helping children to regulate sort of like their emotional experience and why I like this when I heard it is because he talks about how important it is to sort of maximize positive experiences like joy and laughter and excitement because that's really good for the developing brain and the nervous system because you know when we're having fun and you know connecting um your body releases certain hormones and that's you know prevent prevent like creates a really um nurturing environment that the, the the genome is unfolding in so there's so much sort of like benefits to it that you're actually sort of changing the, the way your child is sort of like developing. Um, so, so that was one of the, the things. Um, and really, I was thinking that play also, it helps you to deepen your attachments with your children because they feel understood and valued and you're doing something that they um, enjoy and they they, they take seriously, and so if you're playing with them, you know you're taking, you know you're taking their needs seriously, and um, they can. It, it also, I think, enables a parent to see more through the eyes of the child. You can see the kinds of things that are important to them. Um, that might be issues around sort of they they sort of explain with ideas about what it means to be nurtured or um, what it means to be connected or to be separated, maybe feelings of anger or aggression if they, you know, if there's those feelings around as well, that they can let explore those kind of things um, with the parent and they can feel safe if you've got, you know, like a good relationship with your child, you can pick up on, you know, like how they're feeling and play alongside them or in ways that they find meaningful. So um, I think it's about being sensitive to what your child wants and likes and the type of play they like as well. Um, and Lawrence Cohen's written a really um, fantastic book, um, Playful Parenting, which I expect, I expect you know, um, and I expect maybe, maybe some of the other parents have heard of as well. Um, and I found that really helpful and there's lots of different ideas there of how you can deepen your connection with children, lots of different ideas for play. And also how if you do find it difficult to play as an adult with your child, like he's got a nice section in there on overcoming emotional blocks. So um, I would really recommend that book um, to people. And, oh, I'll definitely put that in the show notes. And um, yeah, just I think it play with a child sort of helps you to feel more emotionally connected with them. And I, I sort of see it like a play is like a door, like a doorway into the child's world. And they can show you what their interests are and they can show you what their concerns might be. And they sort of communicate that to you through play, things that they might not be able to express verbally. And they might not have the words um, and they can they can really show you what's concerning them. And I know when um, Lily, when Rosa was born, that was quite a difficult time for her because she was used to being sort of like the only child and she wasn't that keen and um so play was a way that I found 
helped us to connect. And I think she was able to express a lot of her feelings about it. And then as Rosa grew, we were actually able to play together. And so we were able to play out a lot of those sort of themes. Like we used to play a lot of dinosaurs and battling dinosaurs. And um, I was their keeper and having like looking after them. And I think they we all sort of did a lot of reworking and renegotiating of our relationship through a lot of that play. Um, so it's, I think it can be really powerful um, way of connecting with children if you can be open sort of to the experience. And I haven't always found play easy. Um, in fact, I find it quite difficult um, at times. And I've, maybe I think due to sort of my own childhood ex, you know, experiences and um, play op does open you up emotionally so it's being able to sort of reflect on that and not necessarily let it put you off but just to be acknowledging that you know that you have certain feelings and that maybe finding ways of talking about those or putting them aside so that you can still sort of play and engage with your children and um, another slide Another important sort of one piece that I thought about this is um, when children really want to play in ways that we don't necessarily want to play ourselves. You know, it might be that they want to play, you know, with guns or in a way that we might sort of think of as aggressive. Or Lily, I remember she was really into a game that we called Dino Doctor. She wanted to play the same game like over and over again. And I had Rosa and I was quite tired and um but I kind of realized that that was really important to her and I know that there's some I've read some sort of articles that say oh, you should only play if you're enjoying it and obviously that's important but I think as a parent sometimes you can put aside your kind of your own needs or your own what's temporarily um, to be there for your child in a way that, that they might not get otherwise. Um, and so I, maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe people have different feelings about that, but I felt that, you know, that I, as an adult, I could put my own needs aside for that time and be there for her in a way that perhaps, you know, like another child wouldn't be interested in doing that play. Um, or perhaps they would, but it, that, that was how it worked out um, for us. And um, I was thinking about, um, and in terms of that, there, there's a really interesting book written by Gerard Jones, and it's called Killing Monsters. And he explores how children sort of make meaning of experiences in their lives. It could be, you know, like if anger or aggression um, through identifying with sort of heroes or other types of sort of role play um, and I think both Lily and Rosa at times have been able to really sort of like identify with um, heroes and villains and we've also been able to sort of play that out um, together so I think that's sort of another time when sometimes play you have to it's kind of challenging your thinking about what is play and um what the meaning is for the child and what you know like how you can help them with that and sometimes I think it's going beyond what you're maybe comfortable with in the first place yeah I think that's a that's a huge point that's that's really helpful to consider because like you were saying at the beginning you know you can it helps us to see things through our child's eyes mm -hmm. you know because you can you can see where their mind is you can see their thought processes as the play is unfolding and yeah that gets us to the point now that we can see things through their eyes sometimes we can see when things are really important to them to do in that moment they're in that place they they really want to play they really want you to be with them and yes sometimes you know certainly we're we're adults and um you know, we've chosen this lifestyle and environment for, for our family. And yeah, sometimes we can definitely choose to say, to, to put aside our um, uncomfortableness, tiredness, you know, whatever's kind of in our way in the moment and uh, choose to be there for our child the way they're really looking for us. 
most often um, it ended up, you know, I, when I look back at times that I have made that choice, it, it ended up being really fulfilling by the end, you know, because when you get past your block and sink into it, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, this is just what I kind of needed to release all the rest of that stuff that was blocking me in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it, I, it helps you really get with them. Yeah, and I, and I, I don't, I mean, there are times when I don't, when I have said no, I, I can't mm-hmm. So I don't always, you know, I don't always say yes, but I try to say that yes as often as I can because um, I think, that I know when I do that they do benefit and they thrive from it. Um, but I, yeah, I, I know that it's also about sort of thinking about what your own needs are and trying to meet them in, you know, sort of in creative ways. Yeah. And, um, it, it, That's part of the dance thing almost, right? Like, so if I found I was um, saying yes to them um, more often, that was making me uncomfortable. That was a clue for me you know, am I taking care of my needs? Are there ways, you know, and saying no is absolutely an option and it's an okay option. Mm -hmm. It's looking at my patterns, you know, am I saying no more often for an excuse? Is that becoming a pattern? You know, it, it's, it helps me check in to see whether these are more automatic yes, no's just because in the moment, I felt that yes or no. So th- that becomes more pattern mm-hmm. it, rather than digging in and seeing, you know, why, why yes, why no, what are the reasons for each? And it's not like, you know, oh, excuse me, I need 10 minutes to go sit and figure this out. But, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it pops into your, it pops into your mind in the moment. And, and, you know, you can take those minutes later on, you know, when you have alone time, if it's starting to bother you, the So that's all part of the dance of the relationship with them because sometimes they are needing more um, interaction and engagement with their parents. And -hmm. and you can ask yourself why, what else is going on in their lives that they're they're needing this connection? They're obviously looking for it. You know, how can I provide it where I'm comfortable? Um, You know, that's that's why I love that dance metaphor, right? Because it's always the partnership and and it changes over time with what's going on in our lives. Yeah, and I've, I've, that's also where I found that have, my husband's really helpful as well because we're not, I mean, it's not just me doing it, we're doing it as a team. Yeah. Doing it. So, what, like, it's like tag, you know, like, so he'll take over when I can't get, you know, when I can't, when I've got to a certain point, I can't do anymore. So he, he can take over. And he, John really does enjoy, he plays with, with girls as well. And um, I, you know, Sandra Dodd talks a lot about the importance of you know, couple relationships. And that is another, I think that's another key piece is, uh, you know, not, I know that not everyone is in the position of having a partner or husband, but for me, like, it's been really important for me to work together with John to meet the needs of the children, because I think I would have struggled a lot more if I'd have been on my own. And I know parents do manage and they do it really well. um, But he, you know, working together, drawing on each other's support and sort of taking it in turns and... has been really helpful. Yeah, no, that's 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 a great point. You you work with the uh, you know the circumstances that you have. Right? Um, this next question, we probably touched on it uh, throughout most of the answers, uh, but I found it really interesting. So I was wondering if there was anything else you wanted to add about how your understanding of psychology and your unschooling lifestyle weave together. Yeah, just, yeah. I mean, I'm passionate about psychology. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, yeah. It's just really informed, you know, about valuing relationships and try, you know, setting aside time for the children. Um, quite, you know, trying to prioritize them and their yeah, emotional development above everything else. Really, you know, that comes first. And I know there's a a, a quote by Joyce Fetterall, um about something about you know put the relationship first and then everything else will fit into place and uh that's I guess that's fitted with my I don't know my understanding from psychology and then schooling just seemed to come together quite nicely and there and uh as I I, I've just had as Rose is getting older now and she's sort of sleeping a bit more in the evenings I've had more time to get involved with online things and also like writing my blog and i so that's a way that I've been sort of channeling my interest 
um, because obviously I took time off of work and that was a really just difficult decision to make, um, but I felt it was important. And um, so I've been, yeah, writing my blog and I did, I have started a group um, called Radical and Scholars Discussion Group, which was to meet like-minded parents and to discuss, I, I like discussing sort of theoretical papers and research and things like that. So I was hoping to, you know, the group could be a basis of meeting other people, parents, not necessarily parents, but people who are interested in sort of child development um, issues of self-advocacy, generally child advocacy and uh, and schooling. So, yeah, that's kind of how <laughs> my I, I sort of see psychology sort of quite sort of intertwined really with unschooling. Um, and I, I have, <laughs> I was just going to say, if I do go back to psychology as a, you know, like a practicing cl- clinician, I think um, unschooling is just will have changed the way I practice completely because it's sort of, it has pushed me to challenge so many different things about how I see relationships and you know the world and so it will be interesting to see how those two fit together. Yeah, I, I find it I find it fascinating to see to see how well they fit together too because it, it and that just um, is kind of supports the idea for me that unschooling really um, weaves well with how human beings live and learn in the world, right? It's mm-hmm. without having all those other layers of, you know, expectations and, and school, all those, um, the social infrastructure on top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that it, this is really how um, people um enjoy engaging with the world mm-hmm. yeah and I, I, I probably could say that much better yeah I mean I would say that I think there are different views of psychology you know in the, the, the view I that I like is the attachment sort of based view um which you know does prioritize relationships so there are different types of psychology so I suppose you know that that, that maybe don't place such an important value on attachment yeah. so they'd have a different perspective but my that's a good approach point. Fit, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, good one. Okay, uh, question number nine. We're getting there. What has been one of the more challenging aspects for you on your unschooling journey up to this point? Yeah, it, it, probably I've got, I think I've got two two things. What, the first thing, or maybe three, but two, what was the birth of, of Rosa um, when, so it's not really unschooling as such. Um, so I was, listening, I was listening as well to your talk the other day, um, the po- podcast, and you were talking about some of the things that, you know, like people t- some blame unschooling for things that happen in their lives. And mm-hmm. um, well, I mean, unschooling to me has really been liberatory, I suppose. It's been, it hasn't caused you know issues except the, the, the birth of Lily uh, uh, Rosa sorry um was just difficult to meet the needs of both children but I think any parent probably finds that but maybe being at home um you know all the time to- you know together all the time um having to really think creatively about how to meet the needs of two children was a challenge uh-huh. um, hmm. but I think you know like we work we have worked through it together um, it, I mean, it's still an ongoing thing, you know, because it's it's obviously easier to meet the needs of one child than it is two, and uh, we've got we've got two parents, and it sort of takes us we're both <laughs> full time. <Yep. laughs> but um, so, if I'd have known, if I'd have been a bit more aware, I think I might have maybe waited longer. But you know, between having Rosa and Lily, but then on the on the other hand, I was getting old, you know, like I'm forty um, three now, and I knew I did want to have children, but it's kind of weighing up all those decisions, pros and cons. Um, but I think Lily would have preferred to have and probably did really need more time. I thought four would be old enough, but I got that kind of, I've kind of got that wrong. It, I, I needed to wait a bit longer, really, but that's in retrospect. Um, and the other, ma- the other main thing has really been sort of, which intertwines was managing on one income, um, and balancing my own sort of personal desire for a career um, with choosing to sort of stay at home with the children. Um, that those have kind of been issues in my, for me, and yeah, you know, sort of trying to sort of set aside um, 
some of my you know aspirations in order to parent the children while they they need me to be a parent um but also now as they're getting older thinking about ways that I can re-engage with my interests and my passions um I, you know I'm passionate about the children and luckily some of that coincides you know with psychology you know, like interested in sort of seeing how they learn and you know the, how their relationships are developing um but that has been a kind of an issue Mm -hmm. I remember that one myself, you know, um, because I was at work and, you know, the kids were in school and I remember that whole, that whole process of, you know, who, when I was considering leaving work, um, you know, how I define myself, right. It, it, it completely, you come up with a whole new way and why you want to make those choices, like finding your why really, you know, it often comes back to that. Um, but it did definitely take time to process through that whole, um, that whole question because, you know, I, we grow up in, in that, with that conventional, um, viewpoint of, of how one measures oneself as successful and, and, you know, I, I enjoyed my career, you know, I was, um, you know, working hard and, and doing well and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, yeah, I can, I can totally uh, see how that is part, that definitely one part of uh, a big part of the process for me as well. And, and I found that, um, you know, as you're saying, as the kids get older, I, I became passionate about, you know, learning and unschooling and all the interesting things that I was seeing and you know, that kind of started to bubble up when I had more and more time <laughs> no it's, it's really it, I mean it's really helpful to me to watch people like you and Sue and also Sandra people that have gone through you know they've had careers and maybe set them aside for a time and then they're going on like you know you're going on to, to do new and creative things and that is kind of an inspiration to me because I think it's trying to find a new kind of a role role model different ways of being you know rather than you know like because I have missed that 10 years of a, you know like of a, a career um mm -hmm. but it, it's been I've invested that in my children and it's now thinking how can I continue to invest in my children but maybe invest something in my career but in, in a way that doesn't impinge too much on you know, like well not doesn't impinge on the family in a way that's sort of harmful mm -hmm. um so it's good yeah, it's good good to see sort of people in the you know, unschooling world sort of doing doing things. Um, yeah, I found that too. Like the the unschooling parents that I kind of started out with, their kids are now you know late teens, becoming young adults, and I find it fascinating to see, you know, the kinds of things that the parents have started. Uh, to pick up their interests and how they're developing it, you know, from Ren's body painting to Alex's um, book editing to like, there's a million examples out there, but you know, they have, it's evolved out of their interests. You know, we may have given, given up a career, you know, before, but that whole unschooling experience for however many years we um, uh, focused on that, and also helped us discover ourselves and discover things that we truly, you know, love and are passionate about and how we're growing our more creative endeavors, our businesses and stuff mm -hmm. uh, around that. I, I find that really fascinating, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last question. And this is when I ask all my 10 question guests. Looking back so far, what for you has been the most valuable aspect from choosing unschooling? this is it's the simple word but this is it's got to be the relationships um, yeah <laughs> it's got to be the relationships and I've I've I know because I've been listening to other podcasts I know other people say the same thing but it, yeah it's, it's just it's you can't compare um you know the the relationships I, I feel that you can develop you know whilst in school in with any other type of um you know learning or going to school that's just my personal opinion I just think it's given us something unique um that we probably, I don't, even if we'd have paid, you know, something, we couldn't, we couldn't have paid really expensive education. Even if we had, it wouldn't have compared because you can't sort of buy, I know it sounds maybe cliche, you can't buy the kinds of things that you can 
by you know investing in your children um, and and nurturing the relationships which unschooling really enables you to do so mm. ta-da yeah yeah, ta-da. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, maybe it sounds cliche, but I swear, you know, when when I first started and, and, you know, we chose this for a learning environment, I had no clue that these kind of relationships could even exist, you know, connected and trusting and, you know, people have to get past uh, their viewpoint, their expectations of it. But other than that, once you do that and you see the person that your child actually is, the relationship is amazing, isn't it? (laughs) Definitely. Definitely. Well, thank you so, so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Emma. I have super enjoyed it. And before we go, (laughs) no, no, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Um, Before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Okay. Well, um, rethinkingparenting.co.uk is my blog and you should be able to find information sort of on there and um that if people are interested i have got the radical and schoolers discussion group um which is to yeah to discuss sort of issues around parenting child advocacy and and schooling so and they should be able to find that on facebook oh perfect i will definitely put links to those things in the show notes too so thank you again very much emma and have a wonderful i guess it's almost evening there. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. You can also get your free Exploring Unschooling ebook at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash Exploring Unschooling. If you'd like to connect, you can also find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.